It's early morning along the rugged Costa Brava, the Mediterranean shore of Spain. Past a 2,000-year-old Phoenician lookout tower built to guard against pirates, a Spanish antenna tower technician hurries to get to work on time. Meanwhile, in some free world nation, a postman, making his usual early morning rounds, delivers a handful of letters bearing Soviet Union postmarks. Half a world away, a radio engineer in Formosa, finished with his day's work, heads home for his evening meal. While adjacent to a deserted airstrip, in a building at abandoned Oberwiesenfeld Airport in Munich, Germany, a man who doubts he will ever see his wife and son again pounds away at his memories, at his nightmares, and at his dreams. These men have never seen each other, don't even know of each other, yet perhaps unknowingly they are all playing a vital role in the fulfillment of a single plan, of a single hope. Woven into the outcome of this plan are the fate and hopes of these Americans, of all Americans, and even more so, the fate of all they treasure most. For know it or not, they are all involved in one of the great challenges of our time. Indeed, it is perhaps the most incredible challenge of all. In 1917, the communists gained control of Russia. Then, starting in 1940, nation after nation succumbs to communist domination. Nation after nation falls. Not one nation votes to go communist. The international red wave sweeps up millions of people. Until today, one-third of the world's population lives under its control. And one-third of the Earth's surface is dominated by the communists. Some of the nations swallowed up are ripe for exploitation. They are hungry, weak, impoverished, deprived. The communists, always quick to take advantage of the misfortunes of others, move in, take over. Other nations are industrialized lands with democratic rights, but the techniques of communism overwhelm them too. What are some of these techniques? And can we stem this tide before it engulfs our own way of life? In an era of possible mass annihilation, world communism resorts to more subtle tactics for the fulfillment of its mission. It provokes unrest wherever it can, through riots, civil disturbances, and violent demonstrations. It builds hatred, suspicion, misunderstanding. It exports subversion, appearing to champion the deprived. It stimulates tension by creating hot spots and fanning the flames. On gaining control of a nation, it tries to condition entire populations to blind obedience and allegiance through suppression of truth, denial of rights, and the institution of fear. There are few incidents of people fleeing from freedom, but the number of stories of those who have fled and continue to flee from communist domination can be told in the millions. Each a courageous story of individuals risking their own lives and the lives of their families in daring escapes. Will we, too, ever have to escape? But what can a people do when faced by opponents who refuse to live and let live? In an era when war is unthinkable, perhaps the only recourse against such opponents is to change them, the most incredible challenge of all. But the challenge has been taken on. In many countries of the non-communist world, a group of dedicated people of many nationalities form a global operation known as Radio Liberty. Their aim? Helping citizens of the USSR to help themselves achieve freedom from dictatorial rule by peaceful means. Radio Liberty urges neither mass defection nor revolt. Who are the people at Radio Liberty? What do they do? Why are they so highly motivated? And how does everything they do affect every individual any place on Earth? Radio Liberty, a private organization, 
broadcast to the Soviet Union in operation with little public fanfare since 1953, just before Joseph Stalin died, it is based in New York, Spain, Germany, and Formosa, and has offices and correspondents in London, Paris, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and other key cities throughout the world. It was established to meet one of the great challenges of our time, to break the Soviet Union's monopoly control over information available to its citizens, to break the Kremlin's control over the Soviet citizens' right to know. As in all totalitarian regimes, the Soviet leaders suppress and manipulate information and news to suit their own purposes. Hundreds of Radio Liberty staff members know what it is to live in a closed society because they themselves are voluntary exiles from the USSR, former officials, scientists, teachers, political leaders. They still love their country dearly and work and dream for the day when the peoples of the Soviet Union can enjoy the unalienable rights to which all human beings are entitled. Leonid Pilaev, Moscow University graduate, former ardent communist. For daring to speak out during Stalinist purges, he was imprisoned in Siberia. As a World War II infantryman, he was captured by the Germans, and after the war chose not to return to his homeland. Pilaev's work at Radio Liberty is so effective, Soviet diplomats and agents have often tried to lure him back with both threats and promises of forgiveness. Hanya Johansson, daughter of a Ukrainian poet, after her father's life was taken during one of a series of communist purges, Hanya and her mother escaped to the West. Alexander Vardy, engineer, writer, former Soviet infantry officer, decorated several times in crucial World War II battles. But before and after military service, he spent nine and a half years in slave labor camps because he spoke and wrote openly against the regime and because he is Jewish. Of his 23 years of married life, only 10 have been spent with his wife. Alice Marukian, university student, member of another minority group persecuted by the communists, the Armenians. Her father fought in student uprisings against the communists, was a leader in the Armenian resistance, and had to flee to Iran. And the rest of Radio Liberty staff, each one a human story worthy of a moving novel. Each one a reaffirmation of the age-old quest of individuals seeking liberty, justice, dignity, and peace. To leave the Soviet Union involves great risk and often sorrow. This broadcaster's face cannot be shown because of possible consequences for his family still in the Soviet Union. To protect loved ones behind the Iron Curtain, we will not show faces of certain other staff members of Radio Liberty. These people become voluntary exiles because in exile they see their best opportunity to affect the course of events in their former homeland. At Radio Liberty, each of them speaks for the needs and hopes of the peoples of the Soviet Union. They fight with weapons more powerful than atoms, ideas, and truth. For in the course of history, ideas have changed the world far more than have all its wars. Exiles from the Soviet Union, Americans, and people of other nationalities all striving together, bending the forces of history. But it's not an easy battle. The problems are many and overwhelming. Picture a network of radio stations giving adequate broadcast coverage over continental United States. Now, how do you establish a free radio network in the Soviet Union? And how do you keep the voice of that network on the air for so many hours that practically any time during the broadcasting day, a Soviet listener can find out what Radio Liberty has to say? Because a free radio network cannot be established within the Soviet Union, the only alternative is to set it up outside Soviet borders. To reach the concentrations of Soviet population, it takes three broadcasting transmitter complex sites penetrating the Soviet Union from outside. One site at Lampertheim, West Germany. A second on the edge of the Mediterranean on the Costa Brava in Spain, using the Mediterranean Sea itself as a giant reflector to help literally bounce radio signals right into the heart of the USSR. And a third site on the island of Formosa or Taiwan, getting into Asiatic Siberian portions of the Soviet Union through its back door. Site locations form one part of the solution. Another part, 
the world's most powerful broadcast transmitters of their type, totaling almost two million watts. At Radio Liberty's Costa Brava site, the transmitter in this one room is half a million watts. The most powerful United States domestic radio stations are 50,000 watts. And the huge power plants to keep all this equipment operating form another part of the solution. The power station for the Spain installation alone could supply enough electricity to meet the lighting needs of a city of approximately 50,000 people. A city about the size of Reno, West Palm Beach, or Newport, Rhode Island. Inductance from electrical fields is so great here, fluorescent tubes will light without being connected to anything. Antennas form another part of the solution. Gigantic, soaring antennas, walls of wire, all aimed at the 20 million shortwave sets in the Soviet heartland, sending ideas marching down the main street of the Soviet Union. The world's largest antenna towers, towers as tall as the Washington Monument, passing the voices of freedom through the Iron Curtain to a nation's minds. The goal of Radio Liberty is not revolution, but rather evolution. To bring about changes in the Soviet society, changes which by themselves might appear subtle, small, but which build up, helping the people to gain eventually the right to have their say in the governing forces shaping their destinies. The achievement of this right is of prime importance to Americans, to people everywhere, for it could well mean the difference between war and peace. To help bring about these changes, leading to a lasting peace, Radio Liberty serves as the Soviet citizen's own reporter, a voice unafraid to speak, subservient to no force other than truth, giving the people the news the Kremlin-controlled media withhold or distort, telling them what's going on in the rest of the world but more important, what's happening right within their own country. Some past examples. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The free world tenses at the brink of the Cuban confrontation. Radio Liberty keeps the Soviet peoples informed with play-by-play -play reports of events during some of history's most dangerous moments. Events the Soviet press and radio never report fully, even after the crisis. Radio Liberty also beams special programs to Soviet troops in Cuba during the crisis and to Soviet seamen sailing toward the showdown. Soviet personnel listen avidly to news and reports explaining the possible consequences of a seemingly routine voyage. More news. The Soviets score a space first by launching a three-man capsule. But on the very day after it lands, there is a flurry of secret activity at the Kremlin. A handful of government leaders come together. The Soviet people know nothing from their own press and radio about the goings-on. Radio Liberty tells them Nikita Khrushchev, ruler of the Soviet Union for ten years, has suddenly been stripped of his power and deposed. Some time later, Radio Moscow tells the people Khrushchev resigned because of age and health. But a few days later, a Pravda editorial indicates he was removed for harebrained scheming, bragging, immaturity, and being unrealistic, hasty, unscientific, and impractical. On the same day Khrushchev is deposed by a handful of men acting secretly, the British government is changed, this time by the people acting freely through the power of the ballot. Radio Liberty draws comparisons for its Soviet listeners. The American election follows a few days later. Seventy million people cast their ballots to decide the fate of their own government. Radio Liberty broadcasts election returns, not only in relation to the outcome, but more importantly, to explain the process by which the people, rather than a small ruling clique, select leaders in a free society. Radio Liberty announces President Johnson's victory before Radio Moscow even reports that the polls have closed. Other news never revealed by the Kremlin or first learned by the Soviet people through Radio Liberty or other free world broadcasters includes reports of various uprisings and riots within the USSR, the tragic consequences of a Soviet nuclear test accident, the setting up of the Berlin Wall, the mass escapes to West Germany, 
the growing rift between China and the Soviet Union, and many other key news stories. Indeed, Soviet listeners can get more news programming from Radio Liberty than from all Soviet stations combined. But it's not only news, it's commentary and analysis too. For the right to know requires a free forum for ideas. Radio Liberty provides this forum, helping listeners to think for themselves by providing facts and insights denied them by their rulers. Radio Liberty analyzes the Soviet government's actions and policies from the point of view of the best interests of the peoples of the Soviet Union, indicates positive alternatives to communist doctrine and practice, and helps listeners judge the merits of opposing positions on international issues. Helping to keep the Soviet citizen informed about his own country, Radio Liberty broadcasts programs on such topics as Soviet military and naval affairs, conducted by former Communist Party member and naval intelligence officer S.G. Priyachechovsky. During missions abroad, he compared freedom with communism and, in 1957, fled to the West while in a Dutch port. It is known his authoritative programs are well listened to and highly regarded by Soviet armed forces personnel stationed in satellite countries and in East Berlin. Programs on history of the USSR and of its forerunners. Programs on science, medicine, agriculture, culture and the arts. And Radio Liberty's roving reporters take their microphones wherever and whenever something is happening almost any place in the world, so long as it's of importance to the Soviet people. For example, when the United States sent its first shipment of wheat to help relieve the grain shortage in the USSR, Radio Liberty had its man on hand during the loading in Norfolk, Virginia. Gathering in the unending flow of information to be presented is another mammoth task. It comes in from the world's leading wire services from Radio Liberty's own news bureaus and foreign correspondents in all the world's key cities, collecting and interpreting foreign news as it affects the Soviet citizen. From Radio Liberty's comprehensive research libraries in Munich and in New York. And hundreds of Soviet newspapers, periodicals and other publications are regularly dissected by skilled researchers who also read between the lines. Vast reference files provide up-to-date information on all aspects of Soviet life, data on thousands of Soviet personalities, and numerous recorded public statements made by Soviet leaders. Radio Liberty experts utilize the Communists' own words and voices to point out contradictions and falsehoods. <laughs> And in another huge information gathering operation, over 100 Soviet Union radio stations are listened to each day by Radio Liberty's monitors in Munich. Thousands of hours a week of Soviet broadcasting are recorded, analyzed and evaluated. To give further expression to the innermost feelings of the peoples of the Soviet Union, to their thoughts and repressed aspirations, Radio Liberty provides forms of enrichment the Kremlin suppresses, banned literary works of leading writers and of the young Soviet poets, studies of Soviet society. Some books are broadcast in installments at dictation speed so that copies can be made and circulated secretly by listeners. Outstanding musicians make recordings of jazz compositions written by Soviet composers. Compositions smuggled out under the noses of a government which discourages such music. Also broadcast are prohibited classical compositions of Russian composers and folk music of the many nationalities making up the Soviet Union. Broadcasts of religious programs and services help listeners keep alive faith their rulers suppress. Broadcasts for those of the Christian, Mohammedan, and Jewish faiths. As the USSR is a nation of immense ethnic diversity, with a multiplicity of nationalities and cultural minorities, and with nearly half the population non-Russian, Radio Liberty broadcasts in 17 different languages to the Soviet Union. In addition to speaking 17 languages, Radio Liberty is always on the air, 24 hours of every day, every day of the year, always in operation, transmitting an incredible 262 hours a day, more than 10 times the number on the clock. 
Here's how. By using 26 different frequencies or places on the radio dial and vast switching and technical facilities for teaming up transmitters and antennas in numerous combinations, many languages are broadcast simultaneously. But when a network is separated from its listeners who live in a closed society, how can it get information about its audience? Among techniques used by Radio Liberty's Audience Research Division is in-depth interviewing of Western travelers returning from the USSR. Items of information gained through interviews and many other techniques are evaluated and pieced together by scholars whose work provides insight as to who listens to Radio Liberty. The largest group of listeners is made up of young adults, the takeover generation in the Soviet Union, the ones to whom leadership of the country must ultimately pass. Most of these young Soviets reached adulthood after the death of Stalin. To them, the terrorism, fear, and horror of the Stalinist era are not very real. They are well-educated, patriotic, and proud. Proud of the achievements of their nation's scientists, astronauts, athletes, and writers. They are intimately concerned with increasing the living standards and consumer benefits of their national economy, and are unwilling to see these jeopardized by the international adventuring of their government. As they are less fearful, better educated, and more prosperous than preceding generations, they are more outspoken in their demands for freedom, and they are receptive to new ideas. They thirst for contact and identification with the West, as indicated by their passionate interest in Western authors, abstract art, jazz. They long for travel, not to the moon, but to Paris, London, and New York. More and more, they talk and write about democratization and rights, the right to participate in setting production quotas at their factories and collectives, the right to hear their poets in public, the right to see, to read, to say, the right to know. Radio Liberty also speaks to young men in the Merchant Marine and in the armed forces, serving in Berlin and other places outside their country, privileged to see a bit more of the world. By encouraging people to do their own thinking on vital domestic and international issues, Radio Liberty makes it more difficult for the Soviet regime to secure the citizens' blind support for the Kremlin's policies and actions. Moreover, Radio Liberty facilitates the creation of a climate for change from within. It furthers the development of public opinion in the Soviet Union for greater individual freedom and a more abundant life and it encourages people to seek a greater voice in the decisions and actions of their government. In these ways, Radio Liberty works for a more peaceful, prosperous world. Here's the Soviet government's $120 million a year direct answer to Radio Liberty. Jamming, round the clock, more than 200 Soviet stations worth. Again, Radio Liberty's engineers and equipment get the programs through, with an assist from natural conditions. But jamming has its benefits, too. It excites listener curiosity about programs being jammed, increases suspicion of the authorities' motives for jamming, and supports the people's faith in what Radio Liberty has to say. Radio Liberty extends its unique relationship with its listeners by offering free items through the mail, phonograph records, and books and magazines. As Soviet mail is tightly censored, to request these, the listener is told to write to special addresses in many countries of the free world. Different addresses, frequently changed, are announced for general correspondence. Most letters don't get through. The few that do are forwarded to Radio Liberty in covering envelopes to protect the identity of the writers. Because of danger to the writers and their families, all Soviet mail to Radio Liberty is safeguarded and no letter writer's name or address is ever revealed. Considering the tightness of Soviet censorship and control of mail, the amount of letters that do get through to Radio Liberty is impressive. Radio Liberty acknowledges all letters on the air, including hostile ones. At times, this results in a lively dialogue among its listeners, some of whom react to letters already aired. What does it mean to keep alive a spark of freedom? A dream in the heart of a fellow human being. Listen. Our church has already been closed for three years. The people have no place to pray. For this reason, we thank you sincerely for broadcasting the church service on Sunday. 
it is a real pleasure to hear the word of God. Dear friends, help us as much as you can. Help us to keep our young people from falling under the influence of the communists. May God preserve us all in happiness and peace. Mr. Holland H. Sargent, President of the Radio Liberty Committee, comments. Inside the Soviet Union, something resembling public opinion, as we understand it, is beginning to make itself felt. It's a primitive kind of public opinion, but the present rulers or their successors cannot ignore it. Radio Liberty programs supply the facts that help Soviet citizens reach independent judgments on the basic issues that really affect them. This in turn makes it increasingly difficult for those who run the country to disregard the basic needs and aspirations of the people. In this nuclear age, people everywhere long for peace. Radio Liberty and others who communicate to the power center of communism help to secure the peace by identifying the true purposes of the free world with those of the Soviet peoples themselves. This spirit, courage, and longing for freedom on the part of the Soviet peoples, and especially of the takeover generation, vitally affect all people. For the security of the world depends, in no small measure, on the success of the Soviet citizens' struggle for freedom. The efforts in their struggle may be barely noticeable, but in the long run, it is the many gradual little things, slowly building, which ultimately could achieve greater personal and political liberty for the Soviet peoples and greater assurance of world peace. History says wars are inevitable, but the challenge to our generation is to prove lasting peace is possible without appeasing tyranny and injustice. The devotion of all Americans to democratic institutions and support of those who seek them for themselves and their country may indeed one day lead to a world that is neither red nor dead, but alive and free.